Welcome to the BIS Innovation Summit 2021. Uh, today, I have the immense privilege to welcome Christine Lagarde, President of the European Central Bank, and Mark Carney, United Nations Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance, and uh, the British Prime Minister's Finance Advisor for COP26. Uh, um, in your current and past positions, both of you have made climate change mission critical uh, priorities. Uh, Madam President, dear Christine, dear Mark, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure being here. So we're here to discuss innovation uh, and how innovation can support sustainable growth, including uh, but not limited to green finance. Um, at the BIS Innovation Hub, innovating is what we do, and green finance is one uh, of our key strategic priorities. Uh, with COVID-19, the link between innovation and sustainability has come into even a sharper focus. The pandemic has accelerated digital transition, uh, not least in the payment field, and it has highlighted in many ways the fragility uh, of our interconnected world. Innovation is part of the solution, but it may carry its own risks. So how can central banks help? Do we need a fundamental shift uh, in how we think about our roles to support this transition? Do we need a fundamental shift in our mindset? There are many questions that remain to be addressed, and this is why we are here today. Um, and let me start with a general one to both uh, uh, you, Madam President, and, and Mark. From your past and present experiences, how do you see the issues of innovation and sustainability interrelate when it comes to climate change? Uh, how can technological innovation support the greening of the financial system? Um, that's close to the heart of the BIS Innovation Hub. We'll be looking into uh, issues such as facilitating the issuance of green bonds, using technology to harvest data, to leverage the adoption of taxonomies and financial reporting standards. So um, please share a little bit of your thoughts with us uh, on this uh, interrelation. Uh, and uh, maybe, uh, Christine, if you want to start. Sure, happy to do that. Um, it's lovely to be with the two of you, by the way, because we are, I think, on the same page when it comes to uh, protection of the environment and uh, securing a better future for uh, future generations. I'd like to say two things, uh, Benoit. First of all, uh, following up on what you said, I think that what we are seeing at the moment is a momentum which has been certainly accelerated by the pandemic and it, it has created a sense of urgency that has become almost mainstream. And I think that we should really leverage on that at the moment. That's point number one. And I do share that sense of urgency, wherever we are, whatever we do. Second point, um, I believe that for us to move towards a sustainable future, which combines uh, growth and innovation, we need a few in. And um, by that, I mean include. So include whatever is external and not accounted for. Number two, inform. And by that, I refer to the disclosures that Mark was a champion of and still is. Uh, invest, because without money, we're not going to get to where we want. And invest in particular in innovation. And let me take just a couple of examples uh, on that page. What is being pushed at the moment in Europe is what you could call the smart green growth. And drilling down a bit into what kind, what, what do we mean by that smart green growth? I would take the example of um, smart urban mobility, which is one example. Um, use of the sensor technology when it comes to agriculture. Uh, use of as simple devices as smart thermostat in order to reduce the bill of energy consumption in the building and construction sector. Those are the kinds of uh, either basic innovations or much more sophisticated ones that will actually change the business models of companies, but also the model uh, and the patterns of our day-to-day -day life. So clearly there are synergies and very strong synergies between this sustainable future and innovation. To give another example, which comes to everybody's mind, is you know, how can we move away from some of those fossil energies if at the same time we didn't have the very strong innovation fueling the reduction of uh, prices 
of solar energy panels. Now, borrowing from that particular example, I don't want to be overly rosy because clearly innovations matter a lot and they create those synergies in order to procure that sustainable future. But they, are also, they also come with their downside. And if we take the example of solar panels, for instance, what we do with solar, pa solar panels when they come to the end of their life in 20, 20 years time after they've been installed is still very much unknown. What we do with batteries which have run for 10 years to, few, to, to support uh, our, our electric cars is still very much unknown. And, you know, what is the, um, uh, the, the, the environmental footprint of cryptocurrencies much celebrated at the moment is also something that is on the downside of those innovation. So that's really sort of looking at it from a, from a, a broad um, view. And I'm happy to drill down a bit in the, in the finance sector. But I'm happy also to uh, let Mark come in at this point. Whatever you prefer. Yeah, we'll we'll come to finance in a in a in a second. But but Mark, do you agree with the with the kind of trade offs that that, that Christine has described? And uh, and do you agree with the three ins? Uh, include, inform, invest. And I um, guess I guess economists would say internalize. Uh, uh, inform. I I agree with all the ins. I'm all in on Christine's ins. I think they're absolutely the right way to to frame uh, frame this uh, set of issues. And I wonder if I could just maybe say a few words to complement um, um, the, the the broader economic trans uh, transition that uh, uh, Christine has underscored, including very importantly, and I think um, thinking today about the future. Um, so uh, with some of the solutions today, and what what how do we ultimately through the full life cycle, whether it's solar, batteries, and others, uh, thinking that through. But let's um, let me. If I may, Benoit, segue a bit towards the finance side and think about what are some of the technologies there that can complement and reinforce this uh, broader transition. And Christine uh, rightly uh, included in there inform uh, the technology around climate disclosure uh, is very important, uh, whether it's uh, Europe's non-financial reporting directive or uh, the TCFD is the basis of, uh, of, of informing that, but also a variety of other disclosures. One of the technologies, and this is a technology in that, is um, scenario analysis. Some um, companies performing and financial institutions performing scenario analysis. How do they look uh, as we transition, hopefully we transition in a smooth way towards a one and a half degree uh, economy, uh, climate and economy? Um, what happens if that transition is abrupt? What happens if nothing, if there is no transition or it's business as usual? Doing that type of scenario analysis. And of course, for financial institutions, it's brought up to another level, uh, whether it's European supervisors, uh, supervisors in Canada, the UK, which is stress testing, uh, climate stress tests of, um, of institutions and that set of technologies as well. Let me give another example, which is around um, uh, investors um, uh, who we need to back these types of transitions in our transportation sectors, in our energy sectors, in our homes, uh, in agriculture and others. Well, what do our pension fund portfolios look like? What does the balance sheet of a bank look like in terms of its contribution or their contributions to degree warming of the planet? That is a financial technology that um, some of the leading institutions in Europe already report on this but there's more innovation that's required to make this rigorous so that everyone, everyone listening here today, I think would have a reasonable expectation to say, if I look at my savings, whether it's in a sparkassen or in a pension or in, a, in the market, is it contributing to uh, the solutions on climate change or is it adding to the problems and making that uh, calculation in a way that's digestible and understandable by all of us so we can make comparisons and vote with our euros or Canadian dollars or pounds uh, accordingly. So there, there's some of these core financial technologies that we need to uh, to develop. And I, let me say one other thing and then hand back, which of course the foundation of all this, uh, many of the, found, one of the foundations is just around emissions and understanding emissions of companies and their suppliers and their users, the so-called scope three emissions. So all the way through the, 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 the value chain and how the emissions are connected and then having that reported so that through interlinkages, we can manage those emissions. And I, I, I think uh, providing that basis, rolling it up into these financial technologies of stress testing, 
of um, scenario analysis of portfolio warming or uh, that, that type of analysis incredibly important so that uh, all of us can do our bit um, to uh, to get to the future that Christine described. So since we're since we're now discussing the financial system, maybe Christine, you want to, to come in, and that will bring us one step closer to what to what central banks can do. Yeah, I, I want. Uh, yeah, thank you, Benoit. I, I wanted to pick up on the point that Mark uh, has made, which is critically important, and that's the issue of uh, the disclosures, which hopefully will be required. Um, as, as he mentioned, uh, the European directive, which hopefully will make it compulsory, uh, the TCFD that he was so critical in, in um, generating back in 2015. There is a lot of uncertainty at the moment as to the validity of these disclosures, the authenticity, the integrity of disclosures. And there is a big battle, maybe we'll come back to discuss that uh, later in, in, in our uh, discussion about you know what will eventually be the standards will who will enforce them who will check on them and it's a bit far-fetched maybe into the future but we could think of sufficient innovation that would actually promote the use of the sensor technology in order to actually identify the volume of emissions of co2 the volume of emissions of methane gas for instance and you know, with the ability to check those findings from sensor technologies with the statement disclosures and, and, and declarations that are made by the corporates or that are made by those intermediaries that have the duty to report. And I think that it, it would, if it, it might be a bit too much into um, fancying the future and fancying how innovation would impact this, but it could operate as a validator of things where, for the moment, a lot of operators are saying, well, yes, it's all and well. First of all, it's not consistent. It's not really standardized. There are multiple setters at the moment. And, you know, how do we know that this is actually accurate? Sure, the auditors will certify, but how do they get their knowledge and their information from? So I, my hope is that in that respect, um, technologies will actually help uh, in, in the near future. Yeah. But, uh, no, Mark, please, please. Well, please. I think I, I think Christine's just made an incredibly important point, and um, I'm I'm optimistic. Um, in fact, I expect that um, the sensor technologies will be deployed at scale um, in the course of the, the next several years. I mean, we have a number of initiatives in Europe, uh, in North America, to develop what are called low Earth orbit um, satellite systems, which uh, rid get rid of all the latency, basically, of using satellite technology. Um, and the consequent and, and in building those, um, actually, for example, uh, Christine rightly mentioned uh, methane sensors and other sensors uh, uh, are easily embedded in those. That's the intention. Um, in addition, what they can also do, not just in terms of tracking emissions, very important, but also to monitor natural capital solutions. So if something is reforested or intended to be, re does it actually happen? What's the status of the forest? And using satellite mapping and other technologies to identify where the biggest opportunities are for regenerative agriculture. Uh, again, uh, uh, blue car so-called blue uh, solutions, uh, re re you know, reforestation, if I'm allowed to use that term for mangroves and other, other uh, 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 oceanic uh, solutions for this. Uh, that's, I think that's a big, big part of the climate solution puzzle, but it also rolls back up into what we're talking about in terms of the financial architecture for verification, monitoring, assurance. Um, and of course, with markets, uh, there is a chicken and egg issue. You need that verification and that confidence and integrity, you know this well, uh, and then you get volume of investment. Um, so uh, provided, I think technology does play a big role in all of these markets, straight from climate disclosure through to, as I said, uh, natural capital solutions. Yeah. Benoit, I realized that I did not answer your question because you said, you know, what about central banks? You know, what, what, what have they got to do with that? And yep. my take on it is, is the following. Central bankers are often associated with conservative uh, approach to life. And that's in a way you know, part of the mission because it often includes price stability. So we're not in search of massive disruption. We are looking at stabilizing. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's reassured by that. 
<laughs> no, but what I'm saying is that with that uh, approach, what I have observed and what I observe on a daily basis now is that innovation is actually part of the DNA of central bankers as well. And whether you look at the last financial crisis or the latest one with COVID-19, there has been a lot of innovation in the way we deal with the objective. And I think that central bankers can perfectly well apply that innovation spirit that they have demonstrated in the instruments that they've used in other matters, such as climate change, biodiversity, protection of the environment, and how it actually matters or not. And I would say two things. One is, it is not the prime responsibility of central banks, granted. But equally, I don't think that anybody can get a pass on climate change. And as a result, I think it's for any institution to actually do enough introspection into what it does in accordance with its mission, with its uh, statement to the world, uh, to verify what it can do and how it can do it. And I think we are doing that at the uh, European Central Bank. Uh, as we are going through our strategy review, we're looking at how climate change actually impacts price stability, whether directly or indirectly, how it can reduce uh, our margin of operation when it comes to monetary policy. And I don't want to go into the details of, you know, um, R star and how low it goes and what kind of additional savings people are going to make. But it does matter. And that's only in the area of monetary policy. If you look at supervision, which is also in, in the remit of many central banks, there's a lot that can be done, as, as Mark was saying, when it comes to stress testing, when it comes w whether people prefer stress testing or scenario planning. I think stress testing is something that can actually be done. Uh, and when it comes to absorbing uh, and internalizing this tragedy of the horizon that Mark referred to in his famous speech, in order to identify what can be addressed now in terms of pure risk management, which is something that is, you know, part of the reasoning of central bankers. Yeah. And how do, how do you bring the, the private sector in? Because listening to you both, um, I heard that a lot has to do with uh, things that are happening upstream. It's not only about companies issuing bonds or savers buying bonds. It's about uh, monitoring the, the, the environmental impact, the carbon footprint along the value chain, right? At, at the different steps of the of yeah. the of, of production, uh, and for that you need to to bring on board a lot different kind of of, of players, SMEs, uh, big companies, industry services, etc. So how do you engineer that that collaboration? Well, maybe I'll start. I think um, what's what's becoming clear as we're we're focusing uh, collectively the financial system increasingly focusing on the risks and opportunities from climate change don't i mean obviously we shouldn't forget there's enormous opportunities from solving what is ultimately an existential crisis you know a lot of value will be created um but that then drives this look for information um and as you just said and christine emphasized across the value chain so not just uh, the emissions um direct emissions of a company but of its suppliers and uh, as we as the consumers uh, through the whole life cycle of the product. Um, and when I'm, if I'm providing capital to a company, that's the type of information I want to know, not just today, but prospectively, how is that going to be managed down? And actually this is an opportunity to align incentives with companies, as I say, with their suppliers, many of whom uh, will be in emerging and developing uh, economies. So that's one way we get an alignment across uh, across the world and capital flows across the world and also with uh, with end users. Um, what do I need for that uh, apart from just disclosure? I need um, I, I, I need as well some sense of a taxonomy and I know it's a, a, a big issue but a taxonomy that has a range of assessments not just a binary taxonomy so that I can track progress from where the economy is today to where it needs to get to. And I can back companies that want to be part of the solution um, with capital so they can make the investments that either upstream with their suppliers or themselves or both um, to in, in order to uh, in order to reduce. And that's th these are sort of necessary uh, conditions. If I can make just if quickly uh, another point, because um, uh, there was an earlier reference to um, uh, CBDCs and um, 
uh, and, and the payment system. This is an incredible potential contribution of central banks. And, and you know, both of you know this well, you're absolute the leaders in this uh, area. Um, we can make a much more efficient payment system if we're going to digital payments, a more efficient digital payment system, conscious of its carbon footprint in and of itself, but also how it can link the economies cross border and, and be part of a bigger solution for uh, lower carbon, um, a lower carbon trading system, cross-border system, fulfillment system, and uh, and that innovation, which uh, which the uh, uh, to uh, Christine's uh, great credit and the uh, European Central Bank's credit uh, is leading, uh, is really a, a, an important component. It provides much more to it, but it is part of the answer to uh, uh, this bringing together a, a truly sustainable uh, economy, in my view. But Mark, would, would you go as far as suggesting that digital money can help channel money where it's most needed for the climate, like using smart contracts to, uh, to channel uh, money? I, I would go as far as saying that that is a very promising avenue, yes, because the uh, it's not necessarily that they, it, it, digital money and smart contracts and uh, use of DLT can, can bring these interconnections to the fore and then combined with emissions data can help us optimize uh, and reduce those emissions in the most efficient manner and the most aggressive uh, manner. So it is; uh, it can potentially unlock a huge, uh, huge potential. Yeah, completely agree with that. So we are we're running short of time, which is incredibly frustrating given the importance of the discussion. But uh, I wanted to ask you about international cooperation, uh, which you've both uh, mentioned. Uh, we now have the U.S. Uh, rejoining the, uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, which could really uh, herald a new era of uh, international cooperation around climate. Uh, what, what are the priorities there in the light of the discussion we've just been having? Is that about standards? Is that about taxonomies? Is that about a joint, or is, that, is that about stress testing the financial system uh, jointly? Is that about joint projects that our public authorities could lead together? What, what are your priorities there? Well, Benoit, first of all, I think the signaling effect of the U.S. administration under the new leadership rejoining the Paris Agreement has been phenomenal. I mean, almost instantly, within a matter of a couple of days, we've seen the U.S. Treasury change tack in respect of many topics, including in particular climate change. And I know that, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Jeanette Yellen has, has made uh, climate change, one of the major issues that she's going to uh, embrace and, and, and tackle. The same has happened with, with the Fed. And uh, within a matter of days, again, the Fed joined the NGFS, which is the Network for Greening finan the Financial Sector, which, so great signaling effect. Uh, it brings, you know, the, 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 the power of the first and largest economy uh, in the world behind an objective that we all share. My hope uh, is that by having the US back in the game, uh, we can faster move towards a better standardization, in particular in relation to disclosure. Uh, I've heard so many times, so many actors in the public and in the private sector complain that they cannot move ahead, that they cannot do this, that they cannot do that because the disclosures are not standardized, because the taxonomy is not complete. I think that a, a push that results from simply all players being at the table, or most players at least, uh, will, will be very, very welcome. I would put that as priority number one. And indeed, if from there uh, we can change gear, and move into what, uh, what Mark was alluding to, you know, the, the digital currencies, digital uh, cross-border payments, smart contracts, uh, raising uh, equities over, over debt, in particular in relation to innovation and climate, which is now clearly demonstrated as conducive to it. I think those would be, would be other objectives that I would cherish. Thank you. I mean, Mark, Mark you will be at the heart of this corporation being here. Uh, delivering on the COP26, so what's, what's your priority? Well, I think uh, first is to state, uh, just reinforce, uh, it's incredibly welcome the U.S. Uh, back into the fold, they'll bring ideas, initiative, uh, initiatives and, uh, and inclusiveness, uh, if I can put it that way, and uh, I think there is a number of issues, and Christine rightly referenced uh, disclosure, where this um, 
the consequence of this can be to finalize uh, the approach uh, and have uh, the, 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 the system moving forward with a core approach on, on disclosure. Uh, I, I do think that um, uh, as well, and again, you're both closer to it than I, but uh, the, the central bank digital currency uh, advancement of that uh, for many reasons um, uh, with the U.S., if, if possible, would be uh, is is welcome. Um, and then um, I think the architecture of uh, voluntary uh, carbon uh, market solutions as well uh, is important. And uh, we, we probably don't have time to go through all of that. But uh, this is important because this this is the consequence, just to be absolutely clear, and I'll finish with this is that this is about first and foremost absolute emission reduction by companies and and all of us but in the bridging of that there is a complementary role for credible high integrity offsets for those companies that are reducing emissions themselves and this unlocks a big flow potentially of you know 75 to uh, 90 billion euros a year of uh, cross-border uh, flows largely uh, we would say 90 percent of that into the emerging and developing world uh, which which need, needs that investment. Um, so it's an important component. The U.S., um, uh, given their financial market strength, can play an important role in, in, in that development as well. So on all fronts, uh, and the combination of Glasgow, U.S. returning, all the momentum that exists, um, we want to uh, we want to crystallize a number of this uh, of these advances this year. That's very encouraging to hear. I mean, we're coming to the towards the end of this conversation. So is there, is there any, any, any message, any hope, any, any uh, note of caution that you would like to, uh, to share with us? You know, the, there's one, one thing that I'd like to mention, uh, which we touched on very briefly, which I believe is important. We will see an accelerated transformation of those patterns because there is a demand, because there is that momentum out there, and because the young generation is, is uh, angry and hungry at the same time. They're a bit angry with us, but they're very hungry for changes and and changes um, in in real life and in in almost on time. I think it's it will require a good cooperation between the public sector and the private sector. The transition, uh, you know, will require a lot of training, a lot of retraining, a lot of support, incentives, sanctions, and all of that. And I think the public sector will play that key role vis-a-vis the, uh, the private sector. If you think about how the, the automotive industry, for instance, will be transformed in the next 10 years and how much retraining, recycling and support will need to be given to those who have been dedicated to the combust combustion engine cars when they move into building electric cars. Uh, there are multiple sectors where clearly transition will need some support and will need some incentives as well. Public and private sector will have to work together as much as all countries that are that understand the urgency of this matter will have to work together as well. And I'll just, it's fantastic, uh, just to comment um, to finish. Look, we're rewiring our economy through the digital transformation. We need to rewire our economy for the sustainable uh, transformation. We need to do those both at the same time. Uh, this comes together in finance, um, and many of the innovations in finance uh, will accomplish b both a better and more sustainable digital economy. But ultimately, what we want and the young deserve uh, is a truly sustainable economy. Um, and uh, so there's no better area to work on if you're interested in finance um, and uh, public policy and central banking, because the impact uh, is enormous. And, uh, and I'll put a plug, uh, if only we had a hub uh, for this type of innovation, uh, in five, oh, yes, we do. We have the BIS Innovation Hub uh, chaired by you, Benoit, and uh, so we should channel ideas and energy uh, into you. So thank you uh, very much for what you're doing and for having having me on today. It's a distinct honor. Thank you very I much for joining us today. Christine you, the last, Christine, you have the last word, please. No, I say I second everything that Mark just said, and in particular, thanks to you, Benoit, for dedicating your, 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 your brain and your energy to this. It's critically important. We'll do our best, but we need your, your guidance and, and support. So thank you very much for joining us today. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks.